Good morning. morning. Happy Epiphany. You may have noticed, do you all have a yellow sheet inside your bulletin? They ask you to return that in the mission, so you need to be in the missions basket. So you need to pay attention to that before we get to the offering. them okay if they don't they'll find out (laughs) true enough would you join me in prayer as we prepare for worship God of promise and light open our eyes this morning that we may see your light in the darkness open our hearts that we may perceive your promises of justice and righteousness fulfilled in the babe of Bethlehem May we, like the Magi, have a star to guide us on our journey quest to find the one who will truly set us free. May this time of worship bring us closer to you that the good news of the birth of light and love will transform our lives. Amen. As you are able, would you stand for our call to worship? Darkness is not limited to night skies. Darkness invades our spirits and our souls. Now the light has truly come to us. Arise, shine, for the light of God's love has come. The Gospel reading this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. If you would like to follow along in the Pew Bible, it's in the New Testament section on page 2. Okay. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming into the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated and join with me in the unison prayer. Loving God, who breaks through the darkness of doubt and despair, be with us this day as we hear of the visit of the wise ones who risked everything to follow a star. Let us open our hearts and be willing to receive that you have to offer us in the form of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, verses 1 through 6. If you would like to follow in the Pew Bible, it's in the Old Testament section on page 690. 
Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the arm. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Today is Epiphany, which is a word that means a revelation. Well, what's a revelation? It's when something suddenly makes sense, and we kind of go, aha, now I understand. And it, huh? The light, bulb. the light bulb goes on, yes, ever so dimly in some cases, but nonetheless. We have our star hanging up here this morning to remind us that the wise men followed a star to find Jesus. And we all look for Jesus too, don't we? But we don't always get a star that tells us where we need to go. How do we find Jesus? Where can we find Jesus? Anybody help them out? In our hearts? He's always there. In the Bible? Sunday school? Church? Other people. Other people, sure. Those are all places that we can find Jesus. And so today, as we go looking for Jesus, we remember that he's always with us. We're never alone, even though sometimes we wish that Jesus had some skin on so we could see him. And that's where people like Grandpa come in. It's really nice to have love from someone with skin on, isn't it? Yeah, they're just cuddled up here. <laughs> But it is often through the people around us and through reading the Bible and going to church and Sunday school that we learn more about Jesus and how much he loves us. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for always being with us. We thank you for giving us the Bible so that we can learn about you. We thank you for sending Jesus so that he could die for our sins and pay our debts pay the price for our sins, and take our punishment. Lord, we thank you so much for your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Today is the 12th day of Christmas, which brings us what? 12 lords leaping, is it? Sure. Nobody's sure? Is it drummers? Yeah. Well. See, we start right out with a, a con conundrum here. No. Twelve drummers drumming. Eleven pipers piping. Ten lords are leaping. Now everyone's going to have to go look for this song after the service, right? Do you have this in your book out there, Carol? <laughs> it may have. Oh, dear. I barely got to use my Christmas songbook this year. <laughs> but I know it's in there. Well, now we'll have to go look. But it is the 12th day of Christmas. And actually, Epiphany was celebrated long before Christmas Day was celebrated. Epiphany for the early church was celebrating the birth, the coming of the wise men, and the baptism of Jesus all rolled into one. Drummers, thank you. <laughs> we're, we're connected on drummers then. It wasn't until about the 4th century that Christmas was separated and we will do baptism of the Lord next week. 
So the, the three events became their own entities, so to speak. The Bible tells us that an epiphany is a revelation, a manifestation. I like to refer to it as the aha moment. I remember when I was teaching third grade with some of the math things, and some of the kids would just struggle with, say, multiplication. And when they finally got it, after doing all the little hands-on things and all the memorization, it was like you could see in their face the light bulb went on, as Cindy said, and you could tell in their eyes that they finally understood. It was like, oh, it's so simple once you get it. It's just like using the computer, right, Carol? It's really simple when it, you know what to do and it does what you want. Not always otherwise. That scripture from Isaiah, arise, shine, is not an invitation. It's really a command. And it was written during the Babylonian exile if you remember that period of King Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Bill Snyder. Yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness for Bill. Huh? No, I hope not. <laughs> it was one of those moments that saved the building and uh, encouraged your faith as well. If you don't know why Bill fits in with a fiery furnace, talk to him during coffee and cookie at time. Um, this is a command to the people who are in exile about the 6th century BC that there is hope. Israel will be restored. As they're in captivity in Babylon, which we figure is about 50 some miles south of Baghdad, you've heard of that place? So you kind of get an idea of where they were. This exile was why the wise men were looking at the stars, why they knew about the Jewish prophecy. Six centuries before the birth of Christ, God was putting in place the knowledge that these folks would pass down from generation to generation so that when the Christ was born, these astrologers were looking for that star and understood it. That's kind of amazing because when we pray for something, we would like a response now. Right. Yesterday would be good. This, this process took centuries. It reminds us that God has a much wider view than we do. God has a plan, but it's not always as fast as we would like it. I know lots of us can say amen to that. Today begins in New Orleans a series of parties which begin, ends on Mardi Gras, what we know as Fat Tuesday when we have pancakes and clear out all the sweets from the house type of thing. So this is the beginning of the season for New Orleans. But back in the 6th century as these people were in exile and thought things were hopeless, there was no parties going on. But this passage, Arise, Shine. The nations will come and bow down before you. They will bring gifts of gold and incense. Can't you just imagine if you're in exile, how nice that would be to think that one day that little nation of Israel is once again going to become powerful. And yet we know it was not a political power. This baby that was born, the wise men showed up the Magi. How many of them were there? Three. Maybe. <laughs> we don't know. They brought three gifts. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. How many of them there were? No one knows. And we often say, we three kings. And we'll sing that in a little bit. Other than the fact that there weren't necessarily three and they weren't kings, it's a very nice song. <laughs> Lots of things we don't know about it. But these were astrologers, people watching the stars. So you think of people today who check their horoscope based on the stars. That's kind of what these folks were. But they knew enough from the exile to watch for the star for this king to be born. Unfortunately, they went to Herod to ask where the baby was born, who's going to be king. 
Herod was a rather ruthless character, as many of you know. He would kill off his children, his wives, anyone who he was jealous of. And in fact, on his deathbed, he ordered that all of the ranking officials of Jerusalem be brought together and the gates locked behind them and they would all be slaughtered. That way he was sure that there would be mourning when he died. Really nice character. Now this is the Herod, Herod the Great, who was alive when Jesus was born. Not the same Herod who is there at the trial at the end of Jesus' life. So if you've ever read the Bible and you got confused over all of these Herods, the one who was there at his Jesus' crucifixion was Herod Antipas, who was Herod the Great's son. But just to confuse it some more, in the Bible there's also Herod Archelaus, Herod Philip, and actually two Herod Agrippas. So in case you wondered why you got confused with all the Herods, it's because there are so many of them referred to in here. One thing to remember is they were all pretty much alike. They were given their power by Rome. They were subservient to them. So even though they were king of their local area and top of that food chain, they were really just the bottom of the Roman food chain, so to speak. They owed their power to someone else. And it would have been Herod the Great then who, knowing that he had been tricked by the wise men, set out to make sure he killed this baby who was born to be king and had all of the children under two killed in Bethlehem and its surrounding areas. Pretty ruthless person. No wonder that the wise men were warned not to go back to him. <laughs> you probably didn't even need an angel to tell you that. But just in case, God made sure they knew to go by a different route makes you stop and think, once you meet Jesus, can you continue on the road you have been? You can, but it's very hard because you now know a better way. When we meet Jesus, really meet Jesus, it changes our path. It does not make us comfortable with our world. It does not make us popular. But when we see the light, we are obligated to share that with others. As I said, that arise shine is not an invitation, it's a command. I would like you to picture for just a minute that you're sitting in a beautiful theater. Can you picture it? You've got the big heavy drapes across the stage. You've got the pretty gold seats up along the box seats along the side, the ornate ceiling up there that you're sitting and admiring while you're waiting for the performance to start. And the house lights dim and go out and you are now sitting in pitch black. In a few seconds you hear the curtain open and you expect the lights to come up and the drama to begin on the stage. But there is no light. Suddenly you start hearing some of the actors whispering, like, what's going on? What's wrong with the lights? Can you see anything over there? Before long, you hear someone fall over one of the props. Big crash and a slight scream. And then, after you have waited all this time, one spotlight comes on on the stage. Those few people have been selected to get the light. But why? Because they're better actors? No. They have some light. What do you tend to do with those who are falling over other things? Do you just leave them out there and say, ha ha, I have the light? No, you tend to bring people to the light. I think about so many times when there has been a disaster somewhere and you see people just jump in to help others. They may not be qualified, they may not be trained, but if you have a compassionate heart, it is your desire to help. And that's what God asks us to do. When we see the light, when we see that Christ is with us, 
we are asked to bring others into the light, not to keep it for ourselves. It makes me wonder with these wise men, if they're astrologers, what were their signs? Hmm. We really don't know much about the wise men or the magi, as we really should refer to them, other than that they're not kings in the sense of an earthly king, although that's often attributed to them. People have suggested that the gifts that they brought, gold, represented Christ's royalty. They brought some frankincense, something about Christ's deity, and they brought myrrh. And because that was an embalming thing, it refers to Christ's suffering. We don't know for sure what the wise men were intending with those gifts, but we know they gave something that was very valuable to them. They set out when the star appeared, traveled for hundreds of miles across a desert wilderness, a chance where they're very likely to be attacked by bandits. Undoubtedly, though, traveling with a large entourage, I'm sure it wasn't just the, the Magi themselves who sent out, there were servants and so forth probably with them. And if you're going to go to that extent, you don't bring a gold coin. I'm suspecting there was a quantity presented. It's often suspected that that was the money that funded their trip to Egypt so that they could escape the slaughter of the children in Bethlehem. We know that frankincense and myrrh were very valuable and still are today because it, they're both made from the sap of some trees and it's pretty rare. It takes a lot of effort to harvest that and process it. And finally, then they decided to go back home a different way. Jesus does not make us more comfortable. Jesus does not guarantee that we are going to succeed and have lots of friends and have that ideal life that our society would portray for us. What we do have is a path to follow. I think about our world out there. And our passage says people living in a darkness, in fact, a thick darkness. Do we live in a thick darkness today? If you look at our society in particular, can you say there are lots of people who can't see their way through things? We look at the rate of suicide and drug abuse and abuse of individuals and all of these shootings and just all of this type of evil in our society, that to me qualifies as a thick darkness. But the Bible promises us still that the people who lived in great darkness have seen a great light. That light is intended to be you and I. We reflect Christ's light wherever we are and whoever we are with. I was thinking about that in terms of the moon reflecting the sun's light to us. But then that leads to the thought of go and moon the world. And that just did not seem appropriate because that takes on a whole different meaning. So I edited that out. <laughs> but I just had to share it. Because <laughs> that will be the thought you'll have later. <laughs> Our command is to come adore the Christ child, but not just to adore him for ourselves, but then to share that good news with others. And this morning we have the opportunity to share in communion. And you won't need your hymnals or anything. This is a very abbreviated communion service, but I think very, very meaningful in terms of this particular Sunday. We have come asking for the child, just like the wise men came and asked, where is this child? 
wondering where that love might be born, seeking the joy that might satisfy our thirst, wandering through the darkness of so many mistakes. We have come to the place where wise men and shepherds and women met. We have come to a place called Bethlehem, to a place where our hearts rise like yeast, to a place where we meet our newborn hope, to this place where we taste our deepest joy. In Bethlehem, where we assumed the worst, imagined that no good can come, we somehow missed its name, Bethlehem. Beth, home, Lehem, bread, the house of bread. There is something here that can satisfy our hunger. No matter how long we have wandered, here our hearts rise. Our light has come. And in this bread and this cup, we celebrate something we can't quite understand because God has made a house at this table, a place of sanctuary. Because God satisfies our hunger in the most unlikely places. Because God comes to be with us now and always. It is this expectation that we come to the table to taste and see God's love. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, come on this cup and this bread. Transform these ordinary objects as you change our hearts to shape and form your world with the joy you promise. Pour your grace upon us so that we overflow with your love. Help us to remember how a newborn baby might grow into a little child that would one day turn to his hope-filled friends in an upper room and say to them, This is my body given for you. Take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me and after the meal to take the cup and say, take and drink. This is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so today, Lord, we come to you. We come to this table asking that we may be filled with your spirit so that others may see your light within us and be drawn into that eternal home. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I like the imagery that from this child will come the one who will say those words on the night when he was betrayed, on the night when he gave himself up for us, and the next day to be crucified so that our debts could be paid. And with that, today, we invite you to come and share in his body. And also, in his blood, which was shed freely for each one of you, that you might remember Christ's sacrifice, the new covenant, that your sins would be forgiven through faith in Christ. Would those who are assisting this morning please come forward? And would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we have shared this bread and the fruit of the vine together, we ask that we may sense your blessing. We may be aware of your presence, of your leading, of those you put in our paths who we are to witness to, both by our words and our actions. Lord, help us to be faithful disciples of the Jesus Christ, born lived and died for us. Most importantly, raised again to show the path to eternal life. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Who taught us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you receive our benediction? The light of the star, the light of God's love, shines before you as you leave this place. Go in peace. Go in joy. Go in love to meet God's people in the world and greet them with the good news of salvation. Amen.